First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for a lovely conference. It's great to be back in, in person. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, what I would like to talk about is a paper um, that came out on the archive yesterday, uh, but I will also, uh, in order to explain why we've done what we've done, uh, I'll draw heavily on, on previous work as well. My collaborators in this work uh, that came out yesterday are the, the people on the top row here. So it's Pierluca Carenza, my postdoc in Stockholm, Ram Kishore Sharma, who's a postdoc of Axel Brandenburg, both at Nordita in Stockholm, and Ike Miller, my, my student, who's also here at the conference. Uh, I'll also mention work together with the group in Cambridge. So James Matthews, Julius Isgrains, uh, Chris Reynolds, who's the Plumian professor in astrophysics there, and Helen Russell, who's now in Nottingham. The context for, for this work is the low mass region. It's the blue region, the region basically within the blue rectangle showed here. So rather light axion-like particles. This is a theoretically well-motivated area. Uh, there are many theories beyond the standard model that predicts particles with um, that, that axion-like particles that are light and that couple to photons in this region. Uh, there's been lots of work in this area as well. Um, the lower region here below, say, um, 10 to the minus 11 electron volts and down to, to zero mass corresponds to X-ray constraints. And I've listed a few of the references on, on this slide. A little bit higher up to nano electron volts uh, corresponds to, to gamma ray energies. Um, they're logically in the same ballpark, but I will, for, for reasons that will become clear, I'll focus on the, the X-ray limits in this talk. Okay, so the basic process that I will be talking about is, is what I sometimes refer to as the photon disappearance channel. It's something ra rather simple. So suppose you have a luminous source, uh, a star, an active galactic nuclei, something that sends out photons. And you let these photons pass through an, uh, a magnetic field, say an astrophysical magnetic field. Chances are part of that flux, part of that photon flux will convert into an axion-like particle flux. Um, and this axion-like particle flux uh, will not be observed uh, by your telescopes. It will just disappear. These photons will disappear. Now, important is that, uh, well, there are sources with uh, well-characterized energy spectra that I um, um, schematically uh, illustrated here. And then the survival probabilities, energy dependent in general, and for a particular range of, of parameters. Uh, that means that it, it induces on the final photon spectrum wiggles and distortions that one can try to constrain. This is, uh, uses the Sikivi effect, and um, the basic mechanism was clearly worked out a long time ago by Rafael Tensodolsky. Useful sources to try to look for this signal astrophysically uh, are large objects that are magnetized. Um, the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe are, are galaxy clusters. There are hundreds of kiloparsecs in, in size. They're, they're magnetized with microgauss magnetic fields. Uh, and the magnetic fields inside have large coherence lengths of order kiloparsecs or tens of kiloparsecs. There are also luminous sources in galaxy clusters. Often there are supermassive black holes that emit X-rays uh, uh, at, at, at a very high luminosity that have been observed by X-ray telescopes, like the, the one schematically illustrated in the figure uh, to the left. Now, importantly, um, the conversion ratio of, say, photons into axions uh, can be unsuppressed for galaxy clusters and relevant parameter values. Say for an axion photon coupling of order 10 to the minus 11 GV, um, the axion fo the, uh, a massless ALP would have a conversion probability of order one in, in some galaxy clusters. And in this talk, uh, I will do the unconventional thing of referring to the conversion probability as the conversion ratio, because I will talk about probabilities of conversion ratios. And I, if I talk about probabilities of probabilities, I'll, I'll just manage to confuse myself and, and probably you in the end. Moreover, uh, there are precision spectra from uh, these luminous sources like active galactic nuclei and quasars inside galaxy clusters. So here's another illustration of, of some of the recent work um, that we've done. Um, the best spectra one gets from grating spectroscopy with, with Chandra. And there are just a few sources that, that one has looked at. So then one looks at the source and puts a grating on top of the, the telescope. And so it spreads out the, the spectrum. And then one can get really, really pristine um, spectra out of it. That's shown here to the left. The amplitude of the fluctuation around the, the power law 
um, is of order 2.5 percent in in uh, in in one of these examples, and order 5 percent in in another. That means that theories that predict 50 percent variations in the axiom photon co in the in the in the in the final flux uh, are constrained uh, quite significantly. Now, in order to go from this, like a, a pristine power law spectrum, to a constraint on axions, we, one need to actually assume something about the magnetic fields in the galaxy cluster. Uh, and that's a, a, the, a, a, a slightly difficult thing, because there's no way we can know what the magnetic field is, even in principle. We know about magnetic fields in clusters from Faraday rotation measures, and that gives us some constraints, for, often for, for all clusters that we look at, we, that we need to satisfy. But within that constraint, there are uh, an infinity of possibilities of what the magnetic field actually looks like. And the exact place of the wiggles depends on the line of sight magnetic field for the perpendicular components of the magnetic field. Um, so what one has to do then is to, to take a statistical approach to create an ensemble of magnetic fields and marginalize over all these magnetic field realizations. And then one need to construct an ensemble of, of relevant magnetic fields that are consistent with Faraday rotation measures. And this is uh, going to the point of, of this talk. So in the literature, the standard practice for a long time has been to use a very, very simple magnetic field model consisting of, of cells. This is not made up by, by people doing axion limits, but uh, by people earlier on, astrophysicists considering Faraday rotation measures. So in, in this type of model, uh, the magnetic field is illustrated by these arrows. It can point in different directions. It can have different magnitudes according to some probability distribution, but within each cell, it's fixed. Uh, this is clearly a, a very crude model of the magnetic field in a, in a galaxy cluster. A little bit better has uh, a, a, a little bit better model uh, has been used recently by, by several groups. Is by uh, constructing a Gaussian random field, uh, a divergence-free smooth Gaussian random field for the magnetic field, and then you get something out like, that looks like this that has uh, fluctuations and 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 uh, peak values, etc., and is uh, perhaps a bit more realistic uh, than just the cell model. This, I would say, is the state of the art currently in trying to. Uh, 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 to, to get constraints from these models. So one can ask, how robust are these limits? These magnetic field models, whether they are cell models or, or Gaussian random fields, are simplistic. So uh, can we actually trust limits that come from astrophysics, given this uncertainty of the magnetic fields? Uh, so we did some work on this, testing the, the predictions of the different cell-based models and Gaussian random field models. Uh, in a paper uh, led by Matthew, uh, uh, James Matthews. And um, for low masses, it seems like most of them um, give similar predictions. And then in the, in the more massive region, where we, we get close to the, the plasma frequency of the environment, there's much more model dependence. But even so, th this is not sort of a satisfactory answer, because I've, I've presented two extremely simplistic models for the magnetic field and say they give the same results. But they could give the same wrong results. So we would like to actually have something more realistic. And, and we know what's more realistic. What's more realistic is a full, turbulent, dynamic MHD, magnetohydrodynamic simulation of the cluster environment. Something like illustrated uh, here to the right. So the sides of a, the magnetic field the amplitude on the sides of a cube in which one does the simulation. And that's what I will talk about, of course. But before going there, uh, there's one more thing I, I would like to add, and that's um, when one does this calculation perturbatively in the axiom photon coupling, um, it simplifies, of course. Everything simplifies in, in perturbation theory. Perturbation theory is well motivated because we're talking about small oscillations induced by these axioms. In the simplest case, the axiom photon conversion probability is given by, by this expression here. So it's the, a one dimensional Fourier transform along the line of sight, Z, uh, of the magnetic field. Uh, so this is a uh, polarized. Uh, a polarized action photon conversion probability, and uh, the, the, the conjugate momentum variable eta is just given by the, the squared mass divided by the, twice the energy. Um, so this means that the conversion probability always picks up just a single mode in Fourier space of the magnetic field at any given energy. Uh, here I've, I've, I've simplified to the case where the mass is greater than the plasma frequency. It works similarly for, for an arbitrary mass, then you get just uh, you can get multiple Fourier transform if you have level crossings, et cetera, but 
uh, it's, 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 it's the same thing. It's easier to do analytic progress in this case. So the perturbative formalism kind of works. Uh, this is a little bit of a busy plot in, in the paper by, by James Matthews and, and, and myself and others. Um, basically saying that in this region below the, the dotted line, and in particular the dashed line, the perturbative formalism works well. The region where we have x-ray constraints corresponds to the black line now, and we're going to push further down. So we, we're already in the regime where the perturbative formalism is relevant. However, for gamma ray constraints, you're up in the, the pink region to the top left. You have uh, an order of magnitude left in, in, in coupling before you get into the, the perturbative regime. I don't want to talk too much about that. This is one puzzling thing uh, about this expression I found, and that's about uh, structure and, and phases. Uh, so clearly, the conversion probability is the norm squared of, of uh, some Fourier components. So it doesn't depend on the phase of that Fourier component. Now, these two plots is from a paper by Maron and Goldreich from 20 years ago. Uh, it's an MHD simulation, and then to the left is something that looks structureless, like a Gaussian random field. The stuff to the right, the, the picture to the right, it has precisely the same norm squared of the Fourier components. The only thing that they've done is to scramble randomly the faces of the Fourier components. And then you, you completely dis, uh, eradicate any structure that you have. So this is puzzling because uh, the conversion probability doesn't depend on the faces. So is it then true that the conversion probability is independent of structure? And that's what I will talk about. To, to address this question, um, we've done uh, dedicated magnetohydrodynamic simulations. My collaborator, Axel Brandenburg in particular, is an expert on this. Um, so I'll, I'll show you some movies of, of what we've done, uh, starting here. So this is the, the size of a box. Um, it has a physical size of 200 kiloparsec, um, 512 cube lattice points. The, what you see is the, the magnitude of the set component of the magnetic field. There are periodic boundary conditions. It's, it's initially forced, or it's forced to, to set up some turbulence, uh, and then uh, a, a dynamo mechanism kicks in, so this, this magnetic field undergoes a phase where it, uh, it amplifies exponentially, and it becomes uh, turbulent, and then eventually it saturates to a phase due to the, the, the back reaction of the magnetic field. Um, the types of magnetic fields that one gets from these MHD simulation is illustrated here as sort of, if you go through the, this volume and looking at cross sections and just mapping the, the value of the, of the magnetic field. So in red, it's region with particularly strong magnetic field. And what we would want from this is to, to compare what you would get from have, uh, evaluating action photon conversion in, in along lines of sites or along trajectories along the simulation volume and compare them to the predictions of Gaussian random fields. Clearly, this, there's lots of structure here. They're, they're filamentary structure and the, the the red regions are kind of large. Now, to do this comparison, we, we analytically solve for the Gaussian random field, but we also do simulations to test it. And this is a Gaussian random field that has precisely the same power spectrum, three-dimensional power spectrum, but it looks awfully different, doesn't it? It has very different properties. These, uh, in particular, these high, um, high magnetic field regions are small and uh, um, sort of spotty. They pop up everywhere. Um, so in the Gaussian case, one can make uh, analytic progress. The, the two-point function of the, the, the magnetic field, say the, the hat, uh, indicate that I'm, I'm doing a three-dimensional uh, Fourier transform. So the, the, the two-point function just gives us the power spectrum and then a helicity for the off-diagonal terms. The helicity, it turns out, will not be important, and I will not talk about it. What's important for the conversion probability is the one-dimensional thing. Uh, the one-dimensional power spectrum in particular is just obtained by, by integrating over the three-dimensional power spectrum in this way. Now, the probability distribution of conversion ratios at a fixed energy. So the distribution of these conversion ratios at a fixed energy for the ensemble of trajectories going through a Gaussian random field, one can compute analytically, and it's given by a simple analytical a simple exponential behavior like this. It's completely determined by the uh, one-dimensional power spectrum. So the black line is the, um, the analytical prediction from a Gaussian random field. The simulations from MHD all predict uh, 
that the conversion ratios, the rare conversion ratios for large conversion, yeah, the, uh, the probability for getting a large conversion ratio is larger. There's heavy tails in this distribution. Uh, this can be characterized by the, the skewness and the kurtosis of the distribution, uh, which are clearly much larger than the GRF case. This holds for arbitrary masses and arbitrary polarizations. Um, and it's really a, a reflection of non-Gaussianity. So the structure itself doesn't affect the conversion ratios, but non-Gaussianity does. So the typical predictions doesn't depend on if you look at the MHD field or a Gaussian random field, if you're looking at the same power spectrum because it's just determined by this expression, uh, the, the square, the norm of the, um, of the, of the, the Fourier, norm, Fourier component uh, squared, so the one-dimensional power spectrum. But if you're looking at higher order correlation functions, they will be different because they, they will be enhanced in a non-Gaussian case. And just the, the physical intuition to, for this is that, well, we, we investigated two things. It, it could be that there are larger coherence lengths in the in the, in the MHD case, or it could be that there are high peaks. Uh, and we find that the high peaks of the MHD simulations are the, the main driver of this result. Okay, so just to conclude, we find that MHD and GRF predictions agree for, for typical fluctuations, um, but that the MHD predictions are for heavy tails, uh, meaning that there's a large probability for larger conversion ratio. This suggests, uh, but it's not conclusive, that existing limits are conservative um, because they, they haven't included these large conversion ratios, these large dips in the, in the uh, survivor probability and, and final photon flux. So future directions of this will be to, to use full cluster MHD simulations with existing data to try to go beyond just this, this box uh, of, um, uh, of the simulation box that we have now, and then to look at more observables that we have in mind for the ne next generation of X-ray satellites, for instance, Athena, that will enable us to go down by uh, a significant factor in the parameter space. All right, thanks. Hi, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, so I haven't read the paper yet, but do you, when you talk about non-Gaussianity, uh, do you assume that the non-Gaussianity is in the magnetic field uh, exactly trace that of the underlying structure, or is there a window function or something similar involved? Uh, so, so we completely co we calculate the the higher order correlation functions. Um, so we, we we don't make an assumption about where the non-Gaussianity sort of is. Um, what we did here towards the end was to investigate what drives the, the, the non-exponential behavior of the conversion probability, which is a reflection of this non-Gaussianity. Um, and here we see that it is the high peaks that, that drive it. So it is a more or less localized features that, that drive it. And these are the features of the magnetic field itself? That's right. It's all driven by the magne magnetic field. That's right. I mean, I, I, mean I, I was wondering if this exactly traces the underlying structure or in the MHG simulation, do you have an assumption? Uh, there's, there's no assumption. It's okay. just direct okay. calculating um, on a magnetic field. And in, yeah, in general, it's, um, yeah, I, I think I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. This is really nice work, thanks. Um, would it be fair to say that uh, even for a Gaussian sort of random magnetic field, because you know the probability is sourced by magnetic field squared, you would expect a non-Gaussian distribution for the probability distribution of your you know conversion probability, right? It's a non-linear source. Uh, that's, um, so you get an exponential distribution for the conversion probability if if your uh, magnetic field is Gaussian. So so that's what we that's what the black curve indicates. So that's what you would expect in the case of a Gaussian magnetic field. So it's not a Gaussian distribution of the pro conversion probability, it's an exponential distribution right. at fixed energy. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, so you can analytically solve it in the Gaussian case and you can compare it to, okay. to simulations. Okay, and um, uh, what is you know, the length scale that's associated with this transfer um, in a momentum? Like what, um, you know, that um, you know, eta that you have, which is the momentum which is you know, transferred during the conversion, that must you know, correspond to some inverse you know, length scale. That's right. That's and right. Uh, have, you, have you compared that with the one-dimensional sort of power spectrum that you get of the magnetic field from your simulations? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
so um, the the parameter here um, has has dimension of length. Uh, sorry, it has dimension of inverse length. So one can talk about a, a length scale associated with it. Um, and it is the length scale. I mean, you, you have substantial conversion probability on the length scales that you have structure in your simulation or in, in your cluster. Um, and here, these are conversion probabilities for fixed, uh, fixed eta, so fixed energy and fixed mass. Um, so, um, and, and, but you can do them for any, uh, any parameter eta. So what we've done is to look at, at several values uh, and, and we see that the, the results hold for any value of, of eta. Um, but um, yeah, 